I know that this is the desire of each of our hearts. To cover with his life. That's what this uh, communion service is about. Acknowledging what Jesus did for us and accepting his righteousness by faith. And I'm going to ask that you join in on the last verse when we are, as we are singing, we're going to sing the first three verses. And would you join with us on the last verse as we sing? <clears throat> beautiful. Thank you very much. Our scripture reading today can be found in the book of Psalms. Tony has selected Psalms 47 verses 6 and 7. Psalms 47 verses 6 and 7.
get there. If you would please say amen. <coughs> I still hear some pages turning, so I will for just another minute. Psalms 47, and verse 6 reads, Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. Amen. Please direct your attention to Brother Makozi as he brings our message for the day. Thank you, Brother Phil, and a very cheery good afternoon to you. <laughs> happy Sabbath to each one of you. And uh, also, happy um, summer. Yesterday was the first day of summer. And, uh, you know, I want to just ask you um, to please consider with me as we look at this verse 7 that Phil read for us. You know, there are many people that say they sing praises to God, that the Lord wants us to sing or praise him with understanding, with an intelligent faith. Isn't that right? And why should we do that? Because God is king of the earth, isn't he? Now I want to consider something with you this morning, and our study will be taken from the book of 1 Samuel. Oh, okay. I'll use that in a little bit. The book of 1 Samuel. And we'll be reading chapter 8. Well, starting with chapter 8 here and reading the first, well, I'll go through, well, we'll go through 20 verses here. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 20. 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 20. Okay, verse one, and it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn son was Joel, or some say Joel, and the name of the second Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. So here Samuel gets old and he passes the legacy on to his sons to guide the nation of Israel. Samuel the prophet, and his sons walked not in his ways, verse 3, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment, so they were not righteous men. They loved the wages of sin more than the wages of God. And then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together to Samuel at Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So they went from bad to worse, didn't they? But the thing displeased Samuel. He took it personal when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken or listen to the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other, other gods, so do they also unto thee. So the Lord was pretty clear on this. He knew who was really being rejected in this sense, even though Samuel felt hurt. Now therefore, hearkened unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of king that shall reign over them. Samuel thought that he was doing a good thing by giving his sons a charge, and they, were, they greatly disappointed him in the nation. And then... Here the Lord revealed to Samuel what they were really doing as they were rejecting God. But God was going to show them, you want, you want a king? You'll have a king, 
but you're going to see what kind of king you're going to get. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that ask of him a king. And, they, and he said, this will be the manner of king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for chariots to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. So they would be in his army. <coughs> Excuse me. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of chariots. They'd be his farmers. They would be his, his husbandmen. They would be his soldiers. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. They would make all the dainties that he wanted, the cakes and the pies, and make sure that he was well fed and taken care of. He would be pampered by them. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. Guess what? You're going to lose some of your, your prized possessions too. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants, even your maids and your, your own servants. He's going to take them. And your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. Your brightest and your best will be his. And he will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye have chosen you. Remember, the Lord didn't choose. The Lord said, okay, you're going to do this. This is who you're choosing. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, nevertheless, all these things were revealed beforehand. That the people would, their sons and their daughters would be used in his service. The fields would be taken. The, the goods of the field didn't matter. They said, verse 19, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. Doesn't sound too smart to me. Didn't look like a good deal. <laughs> that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Didn't look like a very good choice to me. Here Samuel had been faithful. When he was leading the nation, things went well with him because he asked counsel of God and God would guide him and he would do what God told him. He became weak and wanted help and his sons were unfaithful. But the people went from bad to worse and they, they chose a king. And the Lord revealed what kind of king they would have. Here Israel asked for king. Hey, guess what? They already had one. <laughs> God was their leader. He was their ruler, right? They were under a theocracy, which means, of course, that God was in direct control of their government, that they were being divinely guided step by step through the instrumentality of God's work upon Samuel. And in short, they were under a government of God, weren't they? God was directly involved in their civil and religious interests. But that wasn't good enough. They wanted to be like other nations. They thought this would be better. They substituted for God man. And today we're seeing that <laughs> replayed over and over and over again, aren't we? Where man in this life is substituting God's will for his own will and man's will. And it made me think about us today. Are there areas in our lives where we've you know, escorted God out and said, no, I'll, I'll be king over this particular instance, God. I'll take care of this issue in my life. Where Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. Oh, we could do a lot of things. But what he really meant by that is we couldn't do anything that was lasting, of value, and that was good. We can mess up a lot, can't we? Yeah. What kind of government are we under today in our society? In, here in America, it's called a democratic republic. And from time to time in history, I've seen politicians talk about our democracy. It's not a democracy. 
And they go over these other countries and they wreak havoc and they cause these wars and all the civil unrest and they say we're helping to establish a democracy. We're doing a lot of good, aren't we? Not. And, but somebody gave a good definition of it. They said a democracy is where two wolves and a sheep get together, decide what they're going to have for dinner. The minority always loses, don't they? And it, it may be a little bit humorous in a way, but we can see what's happening around us. And some Christians in our society, and I meet them from time to time, maybe even in our own lives. You know, who am I to say I'm no better than anyone else? We try to get as close as we can to the world, but still say, oh yeah, we're still Christian. Which reminds me of a verse in the book of Isaiah. Please turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. And this is becoming more and more true as time goes on. Isaiah chapter 4, starting right with verse 1. Isaiah 4 and verse 1. And in that day, seven women, and we can say, you know, a woman in prophecy represents a church. Yeah. So guess what, men? We're not excluded. <laughs> Can't just say this literally for women. She'll take hold of one man saying, we will eat our own bread, wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. We're going to do our own thing, but let us just be called Christians, okay? You know? It's pretty popular now to be called a Christian. Many prominent people will say they're Christians, but the practice doesn't match the profession. God help us as a society. Steps to Christ, page 44, puts it this way. We are not God's children unless we are such entirely. Entirely, 100%. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, you can turn... Bear with me, if you please. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Mm. This speaks to my heart. I think I wrote it on a piece of paper once and stuck it in my wallet. And every once in a while I'm paying something and say, oh yeah, I remember that. You know, you look at this verse and it really speaks to me. Luke 9 and verse 23. Luke 9 and verse 23. If any man will come after me, Jesus said... Let him deny himself. He didn't say pamper himself. He didn't say encourage himself. He didn't say lift up himself. But deny himself. Take up his cross weekly, daily. And guess what? I discovered something. You can't crucify yourself. Pretty hard to do it, wouldn't it? Maybe you, if, you, if you tried, maybe you can get one hand nailed and maybe one foot, or how could you reach the other one? You know what I'm saying? We have to submit to the Lord to let him do this. Deny ourselves, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Paul said, you know, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the way to go, isn't it? Jesus said, Whomsoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33. <clears throat> you know, in this story that we read, the devil pushed the people of Israel. They, obviously, they were not too happy with the way things were going. They, you know, there was no excuse for Samuel's sons to be the kind of men that they were. But rather than coming to Samuel and saying, hey, please straighten this out. You need to do something with your sons. Get them out of the way. If you're too old, put some people in there that are honest and that will help us. But no, they were not satisfied, were they? They decided to go the other route and say, okay, let's get rid of them and let's give us a king. But you see, the thing is, that's how Satan is. He leads you from a bad situation, he drags you to a worse situation. And I've observed something, and you have too. Satan minimizes sin, and he maximizes it. How does he do it? He minimizes it by saying, come on, is it really that important? It's only a little thing, after all. 
You know, maybe you, you, you entertain that thought. Come on, it's not a big thing. You don't have to confess that. You said that, ah, oh, it's not a big thing. You know, he minimizes sin, doesn't he? And then he maximizes it. If he can't get you in that way, and incidentally, life is made up of little things, isn't it? Yeah, little things are important. And then he maximizes sin. Oh, you did that? Ho, 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 You might as well just give up now. There's no hope for you, you know? You, 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 call, you, did, you said that and you're a Christian? Ah, you're no Christian. Isn't that how he does? But I want to give you some encouragement today. I thought of this. It's found in the beautiful little book, Steps to Christ, page 35. When Satan comes to you and to tell you that you are a great sinner, you know what happens sometimes humanly? We think, oh, wow. Yeah, maybe I am. Yeah, I'm not much of a Christian, am I? But the Lord tells us, don't do that. Look to your Redeemer and talk of his merits. That which will help you is to look to his light. Acknowledge your sin, but tell the enemy. And isn't this interesting? She says, tell the enemy. You know, I don't think it's, you know, at least in my way of thinking, we shouldn't talk to the devil, but maybe we should tell him, hey, get behind me. So we should tell him. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and that you may be saved by his matchless love. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> that we may be saved by his matchless love. Also page 53, page 35, and this is page 53. Satan is ready to steal away the blessed assurances of God. He desires to take every glimmer of hope and every ray of light from the soul, but you must not permit him to do this. Do not give ear to the tempter, but say, and this is a positive affirmation. Sometimes, you know, we can be pretty negative and tell ourselves things that we shouldn't. But we need to tell ourselves things like this. Not that I'm great and I'm wonderful, but Jesus died that I might live. He loves me and wills not that I should perish. I have a compassionate Heavenly Father. And although I've abused His love, and though the blessings He has given me have been squandered, I will arise and go to my Father. Remember the prodigal. And say, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. The parable tells how the wanderer will be received when he was a, yet a great way off. A great way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And even this parable, tender and as touching as it is, comes short of expressing the infinite compassion of the Heavenly Father. Jesus says, I've loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. I think it's appropriate today, don't you? Amen. Especially, you know, thinking about communion and how God deals with us. And you know, the children of Israel were not satisfied with what they had. But you know, sometimes we're in a situation where we shouldn't be satisfied, we're not happy with the way things are, are going in our lives. And we want to keep looking to what the Lord has for us in the future. Something better is something better for us. And I'm, I think from time to time about this particular text that gives me hope and encouragement, and I hope it does you too. It's found in the book of Psalms also. It's Psalm 16 and verse 11. This is a Psalm of David. And David said in verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I'll not be moved. He's always looked to the Lord for hope. But verse 11 really brings it to the pinnacle. Psalm 16, 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Sounds like a pretty good deal there to me. The children of Israel didn't choose wisely. They went from bad to worse. It wasn't a good deal. This is a pretty good deal. Go to the Lord. What do you get? The path of life. Fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. <laughs> Never ending. Isn't that right? You know, there was a young boy that lived with his grandfather. And every morning he would see his grandfather sit at the table reading his Bible. And the boy would watch his grandfather. And one day he, he looked at him and he said, Grandpa, 
He said, you know, I see you reading the Bible every day. He said, why do you do that? He said, you know, I read the Bible sometimes and I don't get much out of it. I, I just, you know, I can't see the benefit of it. And the grandfather said, oh, really? He said, I want to show you something. He said, you see that coal bucket over there? He said, sure, Grandpa. He said, would you do me a favor? Would you go out to the well and fill it up with water and bring it back? Well, he thought it was kind of goofy. You know, coal bucket's made for coal, but he went out and listened to Grandpa pump the water and fill the coal bucket up, and by the time he got back to Grandpa, the water had leaked out. And he said, well, look, Grandpa, there's no water. And he said, I know. He said, would you go back and get another bucket of water for me? He said, okay, you know. Went back and got another bucket of water and came back. By the time he came back, the water had leaked out again. He said, Grandpa, what, what's this all about? He said, would you do it one more time? He said, okay. Went back and this time he filled the bucket up and he kind of jogged back, got his back as quickly as he could, set the bucket down and watched slowly as the water leaked out. He said, Grandpa, what do you mean by this? He said, you know, reading the Bible is like putting water in that cold bucket. He looked at him. He said, the more you come to Jesus, the more you read it. He said, even though the coal bucket was dirty with coal, dust and ashes, he said, the more water you put in it, the more it got washed. And the more we come to Jesus daily, step by step, almost imperceptible, it changes us. Isn't that right? Amen. And that's what the Lord wants to do in our lives. He wants to change us. And you know what? You know, I told somebody once, and I mean this sincerely, once saved, always saved, sure sounds nice. I wish it were true in some ways. And you might think, Tony, you shouldn't think that way, but let me explain, hear me out. It'd be nice to know that, hey, I know for certain, no matter what happens in life, no matter which direction I go, I'm going to heaven. But you know, it takes a daily reconsecration, dedication to Jesus, doesn't it? It takes, I think, um, um, Diane, you, you mentioned that, you know, even in your story, you know, the, the, the smooth, easy way is nice, isn't it? But, you know, that's not how life is, is it? Or, or maybe Cherry, I'm sorry, got you confused in my mind. Cherry, the smooth, easy way is nice, but that's not the way it is in life, is it? It's heel, hills and veils, and sometimes it's more hills than veils, you know? It can be a struggle. But the Lord is always there for us, isn't he? Now, you know what? I've observed something, you know? The children of Israel had it pretty good when they were under a theocracy, when they were under God's leadership and his, his guidance. They walked away from it and learned a hard lesson because Saul eventually committed suicide, didn't he? He wasn't a good king. He wasn't a good example. But you know, even today you see some people talking about how our nation was founded on Christian principles and it's a, it's a Christian nation and we should go back to those principles. And in some ways we can agree, in some ways no. We're no, under, no longer under a the, theocratic form of government. But you know, people want to see us go back to that. But we want to be clear on this because the Lord says, it's coming, isn't it? It's coming and it's going to be good. When Jesus reestablishes his kingdom. John chapter 18, verse 36 illustrates this because Jesus made it abundantly clear when he was talking before Pilate. John chapter 18 and verse 36. John 18 and verse 36. Jesus said before Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Another illustration, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And I'll be reading verses um, 31 and 32. Matthew 25, verses 31 and 32. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. When the Son of Man comes, future tense. Also, Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15.
Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. And the seventh angel, this is after the plagues, the seventh angel sounded and there were great, there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. Revelation 19 verse 16 tells us, Revelation 19 16 tells us that when Jesus comes, he will have on his thigh written a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then his kingdom will be fully established. Isn't that right? Amen. This will be under God's leadership. He's going to give the kingdom to the saints, but it will still be under God's direction. Daniel chapter 7 illustrates this. Daniel 7 verses 18 and 27. Daniel chapter 7, verses 18 and 27 say this, But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Amen? Amen. And also verse 27, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions, dominions shall serve and obey him. That's when it's all going to be made right again. For now, we're not quite there yet. But there will be a new kingdom, and it's coming soon. And I want to be part of that kingdom, don't you? Yeah. Because, you know, what we're seeing today is we're seeing things happening. You know, each day things seem to escalate more quickly, don't they? You, you watch the news or listen to the news or read the news, however form of information you get, and you see things and you scratch your head and say, mm -mm, this isn't right. You know, here today we're seeing that, you know, our government is becoming more and more invasive in our lives. What have we seen most recently? Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah. Eric Snowden, who worked for the, for the NSA, now he's revealed that they listen to every phone conversation. They read every email, they watch every website you go to. I think I talked to Riley about this once before, didn't I, Riley? The camera, they look at you on the camera. They're watching you. Might wanna put a little sticker on that thing if you're using your computer. You know, how much time we have left, we don't know. And you know what's gonna happen in the near future? Romans chapter 13, one through six will be twisted. Own it? Do you know that those were Adolf Hitler's favorite verses? talking about how we should obey the government, that the, the, the government was established by God, we should follow it, sure. So long as they don't step outside of the law of God, then that's where we draw the line in the sand, don't we? Yeah. Isn't that true? I mean, all kinds of things happening right before our very eyes. I mean, I found it pretty interesting too that you know, our civil liberties are being shredded right before our very eyes, and soon our religious liberties will be Shred. That's what's coming next. You're watching the civil liberties go. I was amazed. You know, I talked to some people just, to, you know, just to, from place to place, ask people what they think. And it's amazing. Most people just, you know, here the Supreme Court voted down the law that uh, the state of Arizona proposed, that they wanted every person in their state to be a legal citizen before they can vote. Now, the Supreme Court said no. They're pushing for the amnesty thing. You know what's going to happen. You know, they're, they're, they say, oh, we're going to have a new amnesty bill, you know, and, and we're going to take care of our borders and, you know, this problem we have with immigration. They're going to wait till all 30 million are, are well seated in the country before they decide to start building a fence, which had already been, the law had been passed for. The Pope, oh, interesting. The Pope's accepting atheist. He's accepting um, Let's see who else. He's accepting bikers, <laughs> gangs, you know? I mean, homosexuals, it, it's all go with him. And you know what's gonna happen, the reason why he's, he's accepting all of these groups, and you don't even have to be a Christian to come into the Catholic communion, so that in the future when they enact their laws, they will accept him, isn't that right? So we can see things happening very quickly before us, but you know what, you know, we need to choose a king too, don't we? 
and, and I say, you know, it's like one man, he put up a sign in his yard, it was time for people to, to vote, you know, around, I think it was like beginning of November, vote for John Jones or vote for Mary Smith for this. He put up a sign, vote for Jesus. <laughs> I say, I don't you? Let's vote for Jesus today. God bless you. Have a very happy Sabbath.
rededicate their lives to do your will, to follow your example. Lord, I pray that we'll all be together in your kingdom to sit down with you at the table that you prepared for us and to live forever in your heavenly home, I pray. In Jesus' name, we ask these things.